Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Marantis Labs Tech Talks, where we dive into cloud native technologies, uh, use, case, use cases, tutorials, and many more to educate you all. I'm Avinash Desiradi, developer advocate and solutions architect here at Marantis. Joining me today, Varag Brudo, developer advocate at Scribe Security, to talk about security, SCM security posture. Varag, thank you so much for joining me here today. Uh, can you please uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself? What do you do at Scribe Security? And what, of, what sort of challenges Scribe Security is solving for the ecosystem? Of course. Well, um, like you said, this lecture is getting started with GitHub Security or SCM, specifically GitHub in this case. Scribe Security is a company dealing with software supply chain security issues, specifically uh, integrity verification, something relatively new using SBOM and other tools. And I'm here to make our messaging, both the problem and the solution more accessible to people so that people would know what we're about and how we are setting out to help basically everybody who's using the software supply chain, you know, software supply chain, which is everybody uh, to be more secure. And uh, well, I can actually start uh, by telling a little bit more about myself. And sure. Uh, yeah, before we just go dive into that, I'm just gonna do a quick uh, housekeeping item. Uh, so uh, uh, any, anyone like who has like questions, uh, please use the Q&A section in the chat and uh, we will get through these questions like throughout the session. Thank you. Yeah, Barak, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, to everybody, welcome to this lecture, getting started with GitHub security. Uh, my name is Bach Budo, as you can see here, uh, and I'm the DevRel for Scribe Security. I have a bachelor degree in uh, education. I'm specializing in art. You probably didn't expect that from a cybersecurity uh, DevRel. Uh, and this lecture is based on Scribe's uh, open source tool for GitHub security report. It's called GitGat. You can see the um, icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so what are we actually talking about? Well, for one thing, I would like to ask you without checking, do you know if your GitHub account is securely set up or how many of your repositories are public or private to that matter? Uh, if any of your branches are additionally protected, if they have special uh, defensive capabilities, even against admins, for example, and if anyone can do whatever they want with your repositories, uh, write, merge, delete, essentially how open is your GitHub uh, security posture? And I'm guessing just like me before I started you know, to do this, the answer to most of these questions is no, I, I don't know. And that's exactly why we're here. So uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, Scribe decided to do GitGat. Uh, GitGat evaluates the security settings of your SCM, which is source control management system uh, account, uh, and provides you with status reports and actionable recommendations. Essentially, it's really, really easy to, to, to start using, even if you don't have that much information or, or you know, programming skills. First, you need to uh, get yourself a GitHub token. It's really easy to do. GitHub is very uh, helpful with that. But then you can run it very simply using a Docker run, just like it shows here on the screen. Uh, and the report will appear in your gists. For those of you who have never accessed your GitHub gists, uh, the way to access them is at the top right, right under that little icon of you. If you click open on that, you'll get a big list of various options, settings, and so forth. The bottom third of that list, it says your gists. Essentially, it's a place for various notes, stuff like that. So we decided that GitGat should uh, be uh, ported there. It shows there in two versions, both a JSON file, which is more machine readable, and as a lovely uh, report, which you can see here on the screen. Uh, this is the uh, an, an actual example of the report I was running um, recently on a fake organization I built. It's called Stride Demo. Uh, I build it, I put a couple of uh, repositories in it so I can you know, play with it and, and run this report and various other things. Um, this is the beginning of the report. You can see uh, the, the first category is uh, repository public visibility and access. Uh, all the other categories look pretty much like this one. There's the motivation, findings, and a rock of recommendations for you know, fixing those 
findings or, or you know, errors or problems, if you want to, with actual links to, to take you to the right place and, and uh, fix it. Um, so now that we've seen this actual report, let's start actually talking about the uh, various things that encompass the GitHub security posture. Well, me and you know some of my friends here consider the GitHub security posture to be composed of these four central, let's call them groups of, of topics. First, access control. It's easy to understand. Who has access to your things? Who has access is a very important thing. Second, permissions. Once they have access, what are they allowed to do? It's also a very important thing. I already mentioned the admin thing earlier. That's going to play a part later. Branch protection, even if they had access and they have permissions, you can still add special protections to certain branches or certain named branches to give them special properties, special, let's call them defenses, protections, um, to make them more um, re resilient to modification, especially unwanted modification. And finally, if everything else failed, you have modification tracking. So can, you can at least know what other people did with or without your approval with your repositories. So these are the four main groups that we're going to be talking about. I'm not going to necessarily tell you for each, um, for each topic which category it belongs to. I think it's going to be pretty self-explanatory. So the first thing, pretty much like in the report, is going to be repository public visibility and access. So public repositories, just like it says here on the screen, are accessible to everyone on the internet. That means that anyone on the internet can see this repository, but you get to choose who can commit. Now, the important thing here is that when you create a new repository, it's going to be public by default. Another important thing is that very few people would actually go back and change the, the public visibility of a repository even after a long time has passed. Now, after a long time has passed, some things may have changed. For example, you may have added code to this repository that you would rather not anyone on the internet would be able to see. You might have put in, either by mistake or on purpose, some secrets, some passwords, tokens, various things that you would really, really rather keep private. Obviously, you should put them on GitHub anyway, but assuming you did, you would really rather keep those Private. And of course, you might have developed the next big thing in tech, and you would really rather keep your IP or you know intellectual property private so that nobody else can look at it, say it's a great idea, take it and make the millions that you intended to make. So let's say that you do have a public repository and you want to change that visibility. You want to make it private so that you get to choose who gets to see it, who gets to commit, who gets to do anything with it. Essentially, it's just for you. So it's pretty easy to do that. Basically, you can do that in settings. Uh, if you get to the setting of a repository, at the very, very bottom, there's an area called the danger zone. You can see a screenshot on, on, on the screen here. And the very first option in that danger zone says change repository visibility. Essentially, you click change visibility, you can change it from public to private and vice versa. So obviously, it's important to know, you know which one of these two you want to be in. And I would highly recommend to, to you know, once we're done with this lecture or whenever you get the time, to look at your repositories and make the conscious decision rather than just doing it by default, which of those repositories should be public and which should be private. In terms of uh, getting there directly from a link, the uh, building that link is pretty easy. GitHub.com, the username. In my case, for example, my username on GitHub is Mr. B Lightning, a repo name, and then settings. So like I said, just the settings of a repository. So this is a pretty easy thing to, to do, to remember. Let's dive in a little deeper. Two-factor authentication. 2FA aims to protect your account from credential theft. Um, you probably know 2FA from various other applications, uh, even just accessing your workstation. I have an interesting story about this one. Uh, a few years ago when I was working, uh, obviously, as a developer uh, in a supply chain, not software, just a regular supply chain uh, company, uh, we were told that we need to set it up so that 
users would never have to log off because they didn't want to log in again. Um, and we needed to find a way for their credentials or their you know, user accounts would not be mistreated because of a special story. Uh, we had an application, one of our users had it on his phone because that's where you keep those applications. And he gave it to his daughter to play with. And unbeknownst to him, she found that application, opened it and ordered 40 tons of chicken to be delivered the next day to the store he was working in. Um, 40 tons of chicken is a lot of money and a lot of chicken. They didn't need that chicken. Uh, luckily it was caught on time, but that's exactly the sort of thing you need to a fate for because you know either people would hack your account, steal credentials from GitHub directly, or it would be something even as, as simple as somebody uh, you know going on your station when you're out for a coffee or on vacation and they happen to know your station is free. Uh, usually it just means that other than the username login, you are connected to some sort of uh, approving application on your phone. So once you put in your username and password, you will be required to enter a specific code. And only after that, which is the second uh, authentication, only after the second part of the authentication, you'll be able to access your GitHub. Uh, this is true both for single users and organizations. Uh, for a single user, I put the link right up there. I, I don't want to go through the, the, you know, reading it out loud. Uh, hopefully this um, presentation will be able to be shared later. You can just click on the link. Uh, you, once you go to the two-factor authentication area, you can enable it. It will ask you which application on your phone you wish to include. Then scan uh, the QR code, make the link. That's it. That's pretty simple. But if you're an organization, things can get a little more interesting because not only can you require two-factor authentication from everyone in your organization, in this case, my, my fake scribe demo organization, uh, if you didn't have two-factor authentication and you decide to set it up, anybody, members, billing managers, collaborators, anybody who currently has access to your uh, organization and doesn't have two-factor authentication on their account will no longer have access. They'll be pushed out, they'll get an email, you need to, that they'll need to set up two-factor authentication to get back in. Uh, obviously, you can't set it up unless you yourself, the owner, have two-factor authentication on your account, just like it says so on the top right. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see that I've included the link to the GitHub documentation about two-factor authentication. It's quite extensive. There are lots of uh, possibilities. I highly recommend adding it. It's pretty damn simple, and it's just a little thing more you can do to secure your account and make sure that, you know, even if somebody happened to get your login and password, um, you would at least not be, you know, essentially handing your repositories away to that evil person. Moving on, admin permissions. Remember, we talked about admins. They have a large part to play, obviously. Admin permissions allow full control over your organization. Obviously, when I'm talking about admins, I'm only relevant for organizations because if you're a single developer, obviously you are the admin and the only one in your account. If there's an organization, there could be more. Now, the problem with this is that um, if you don't want to start messing with specific permissions, it's so much easier if somebody wants something specific to just say, okay, I'll just make you an admin. You can do whatever you want. But too many admins and you start having a problem because then everybody has very high level access. They can do anything, including breaking changes that you really don't want to give everybody the ability to do. Uh, the recommendation is that if you are working with an organization, you have teams, then, you know, at most, only one person on each team should be an admin. Usually, you know, the, the supervisor, the person whose job it is to go over all the pull requests and approve them, but you really shouldn't have a team with three people and all three people are admins. That really is not considered uh, best security etiquette. Um, if you go to the link, which I've described here, github.com, organizations, the organization name, the settings, member privileges, you can see that uh, you can set up admin repository permissions. So even, I mean, assuming you're the owner, obviously you can do anything, but even if you want to have more than one admin, let's say that for whatever reason you need those, you can limit the stuff that all these other admins, not you, can do by going to this uh, address and, and you know setting some stuff up. 
You can allow members to change repository visibility for this organization or not. You can uh, allow members to delete or transfer repositories for this organization, again, or not, and so on and so forth. So there are multiple things that you can decide to do uh, if you want to allow multiple admins, but you don't really want to give them all the privileges. Like really, they can do anything same as you, the owner of this organization. Uh, again, all of this stuff, really easy to set up, really easy to do. All you have to do is just dig in a little deeper. Um, the next thing is also, again, a really, really fun little thing that you can do, signed commits. Signing commits and, and the uh, additional tags that go along with it helps promote confidence and changes you or anybody else with a signed commit makes. This is an example uh, taken from the GitHub documentation of a user who's using signed commit. And you can see the user who did this, in this case, uh, Octocoat. And you can see the tag that says that this person is verified. Now, because most developers are working on their own machine, they develop the code, then they push that code over to GitHub. Uh, what you need to do is essentially set up uh, the GitHub signing on your local machine. Once you set it up, again, really easy. You can learn how to do it in the link that I provided. And I also provided the, the uh, example here, git config commit uh, uh, gpg sign true. And essentially from that moment on, all the pushes, all the commits that you do would be signed and verified by you, the user. It's obviously uh, particularly important, not just because you know people may not know who you are, but even if they do know who you are and somebody took over your account and then submitted for you, it is much easier to be able to track this when everybody is using signed commits. Something that is not necessarily known is that GitHub will automatically sign commits that you make using the web interface. So if you don't use the uh, Git CLI, but you actually go to the web interface and commit from there, GitHub will automatically sign those commits because obviously if you're using the web interface, you had to sign into GitHub so it knows who you are. Uh, instructions for configuring your local Git installation to sign commits to work with GitHub can be found here. And again, it's basically pretty much like uh, setting up an additional CLI, just a couple of simple commands and voila, you don't have to mess with it anymore. All your commits will be signed from that moment onwards. Branch protection rules. Now, this is probably the biggest topic that I'm going to cover, especially because there are so many rules. Uh, branch protections <clears throat> are specific protection mechanisms that limit users from making dangerous modifications to repositories. There are lots of details. Again, I included the GitHub documentation. Um, by default, this doesn't apply to admins unless you, know, you go to the admin privileges and include them or include the admins and rules when you set this up. Some example rules that we can look at are requiring a pull request before merging, requiring signed commits from everybody, restrict who can push to matching branches. Um, some others that I remember offhand, for example, is uh, limiting um, merging so that you will keep uh, a linear history and there's no gaps in the information provided. Uh, you can use naming patterns to choose which branches are covered. Um, for example, if you use asterisks, um, asterisks, uh, submit asterisks and all branches who have submit in their name will be covered by a specific rule. If you use asterisks, delivery asterisks, again, same thing. Uh, the recommendation, the basic, you know, best practice recommendation is that rules should be enacted at least for main branches, as in, you know, the main branch of your repository, not some others like dev or, or you know, testing, but if you have a main branch, at least that branch should be protected. Um, Branch protection is managed at the repository branch level. You can go to github.com, org name, repo name, uh, settings, branches. Um, obviously, you need to set this up for each repository separately. There are no rules that in, are enacted for all repositories. Even if you do use the naming uh, conventions, they, they are only relevant for a particular repository. So if you have multiple repositories, I'm sorry to tell you, you'll have to set it up for each one separately. Um, this is a screenshot from the branch protection rule example. You can see on the top the branch name pattern. Uh, this is the place where you, you can start playing with uh, asterisks if you are so inclined. And this is a list of rules which you can choose to enact on that particular 
branch or repository. Uh, again, we have requiring uh, pull requests before merging, requiring status checks to pass before merging. Status checks, for those of you who don't know, could be uh, pending, success, failure, uh, and so on and so forth. Obviously, in this case, we would want to see success. Require conversation resolution before merging. Require signed commits, very popular. Uh, require linear history. That's what I told you about keeping um, merge commits from being pushed to matching branches, thereby uh, going over some of the history. Require deployments to succeed before merging. Uh, include administrators. If you mark that, then administrators are also limited by those same rules. And restrict who can push to matching branches. Um, you can specify people, teams, and so on and so forth, who are limited by this rule. So again, this is probably the most comprehensive protection which you can offer to a particular uh, repository or branch. And again, the best practice in terms of uh, security posture is that the, at the very least, the main branches of each repository will be protected in this way. You can choose whichever rules you want, but you know some of them just, just make sense. Um, and finally, organization access tracking. Remember I talked about uh, tracking changes. So um, Gitgat does that separately, but because I, I do not want to assume that you'll all you know, run to GitHub and check out Gitgat, um, I found a different way to do this. Uh, for organizations and organizations only, there is such a thing that is called audit log. The audit log lists organization events within the previous six months and only owners can access their audit log. Um, the audit log is accessible from github.com organization, org name settings audit log. Uh, you can see an example uh, right here. Uh, you can filter it by users, by repositories, by teams, multiple ways to, to slice this data to try and figure out exactly what it is you're looking for. Um, I've included uh, the documentation on the next page, I think, uh, that shows you all the myriad of things you can do with the audit log. But just in this page, you can see that Mr. Lightning, aka me, um, added a particular person to a team. Uh, I wanted to include a couple of more examples. So you can see the, here that I added a particular person to uh, a different repository, that I created a repository, disabled uh, the depend about alert, or blocked a merge. You can also do that uh, from a particular repository. Um, again, like I said, the documentation is uh, included here, um, and I encourage you to go and check it out, even if you are not, uh, you know, in charge of an organization or, you know, need to check the audit log, just so you know what is there and what is available, because it's a really, really useful tool if you're looking to, to you know, track changes, especially malicious or unwanted changes in your repository. And notice if you're an organization, it covers everything, all the repositories in your organization, all the teams, everything, not just a particular repository. Uh, and finally, I know it's not exactly a uh, GitHub security posture, but it's just common sense. And I couldn't have a lecture like this without including this. Never, ever, ever store credentials as code or configurations in GitHub, even if you're sure it's private, even if you're sure nobody else can see it. Just, just don't put it up there. That's exactly why you have, you know, Git hide or, or uh, other me mechanisms to not push those things into GitHub. Obviously, they can be circumvented. Just, you know, try really hard not to put any secret things that should not should be you know, remain private, like your S3 um, token, not on GitHub. Oh, uh, that's pretty much it. I would like to say uh, thank you. I know that there's lots more I could talk about it, but I really tried to keep this simple, to keep this easy. There's lots of documentation on everything that I've covered. You can go there to learn more. Uh, my email is included here, Barak at Sprite Security. You can contact me with any questions. I would gladly answer. Obviously, I encourage you to try Gitgat, our uh, open source security uh, report. Um, if you have any questions about Gitgat, you can also <laughs> contact me. Um, and I would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to me this morning. Thank you. All right, uh, Barak, like, thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing all this information. Uh, it was very helpful and uh, it is very valuable for me and then for our uh, audience here. Uh, 
just a quick note uh, we have like few upcoming sessions uh, uh, in coming weeks, uh, please do check out Amarantis um, Labs uh, and sign up for the sessions that you are interested in. Uh, we would love to uh, join like more and more sessions and uh, learn more about the cloud native topics. Uh, with that, uh, like the recording uh, will be available in Amarantis Labs Tech Talk, uh, the Tech Talk YouTube channel, and uh, we will be posting it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, with that, uh, thank you so much, uh, Barak, for uh, for joining me here today. Uh, it is uh, very helpful, and uh, I think we can end uh, end it here. Uh, uh, have a good day, uh, and you. all You're of you. Welcome. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Bye.